Welcome back everyone to TNO, The Last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Guangdong Lover, but Nighttime Rebellion is what we must talk about next. The perimeter around the city's buildings and offices have been steadily shrinking over the night. The crowd was relentless, hurling Zidane of cocktails and ex expletives against a cordon of black-clothed metropolitan police and their scant provincial reinforcements in equal measure. The usual insults, traitor, collaborator, lackey were hurled, but far more concerning were the slogans. Driven by demands of corporate dismantlement of Japanese expulsion of labor unionism of unification with the northern countrymen, the crowd pushed a cordon ever closer to the buildings they protected and the people inside. As the police held the ground outside the government district, Shokan burned. Vindictive workers and angry laborers crashed into their unguarded workplaces, burning records, torching papers, and smashing the machine tools on which they'd spent so many hours. There was nothing to stand in their way. The buildings of the industrial district soon lay ablaze in a dozen t towering funeral pyres. The sun rose over a deserted city, and the police strode forth from the redoubt, reinforced overnight. As they got about, uh, set about scouring for any troublemakers unfortunate enough to be left behind, there was one phrase that seemed inescapable. Graffiti on signposts, walls, and on the streets, dignity is a right, not a privilege. And into the breach. In the Santo Police headquarters, uniformed officers barked orders over radio police uh, uh, to the radio riot police on the front lines, even as adjutants penciled in the movements and events of the day on a map of the city pinned to the wall behind um, Commissioner Mori. Also, Unit 05 has arrived, approaching the target building now. The operator's voice was coolly professional. Before their eyes wide in contact, assault units be taking concentrated fire, shooters reported in the surrounding buildings. A more not a grim as adjutants began to splash, uh, add splashes of red to the map behind him. The kidnappers, as everyone had feared, were more than ready to defend their positions to the death, and the police were prepared to respond in kind. One by one, the isolated holdouts began to fall silent, marked with a large red X on the map. A constellation of ink and fireworks spreading across paper with no hostages in sight. The surviving members of the assault teams were hurriedly redeployed to fill the ranks of those depleted under heavy fire. Amori gritted his teeth. They finally his family eventually, but the kidnappers would make him bleed for him. Found him, Amori's head swiveled and instantly as he heard the single crucial report. Unit 4 is zero closing, reporting a single armed suspect with the hostages. Suspect is distressed. Take him out, Amori roared before they can do anything to. Shots fire, the operator's face grew pale before they finished the report. Hostages down, one woman dead, one child injured. Uh oh. Security bulletin. The Japanese Consulate General in uh, Guangdong advises all Japanese citizens to exercise caution in public spaces. Do not leave your residence at night. Avoid unnecessary excursions during the day and minimize the time spent on public transport. Travel in small groups to maximize safety. Well, that's useless, Okura said, sprinkling the contents of the official bulletin in his hand before turning to Akito. Sitting at the desk goes, right, boss, I still have to come to work, but they have a driver and we don't. Akita sighed, taking a quick glance around the crowded office, same as everyone else, right? Suck it up, head out as soon as you can. I hope you get lucky and stay lucky. Did you know what happened to Kose? Spoke Japanese too loudly on a streetcar street car and got punched in the face for it. I think the thing the thing was still moving when they tossed him off of it. The poor guy nearly got hit by a car. Yeah, Akira and Okura both nodded grimly, united in knowledge of their shared vulnerability. Their background is now a target rather than a mark of prestige. At least Kose got, gets to go home, Okura said after a long pause, to Japan and company money. Lucky guy. So that's going to pe penalize us for a little bit. But we did get a benefit at the end, or sometime in the last episode. So In the meantime, I really don't want to increase Japanese frustration as observing the crisis, but I think we can do that a little bit. I can't remember, I'll be honest. Uh, we want to increase Japanese, uh, we want to increase government despair. And we're still working on this one here, so. Uh, I don't mind doing it maybe once. More government control in the state. That'd be pretty nice. <sighs> Excuse me, snap inspections as we completed this. Oh, also, this route we're taking is very bad for us. Oh my god, this is very tough for us. This is not good at all. Jesus Christ. Uh, but we invite the leadership. Over the course of the riots we've come in the wake of the oil crisis, two major factions have emerged with li uh, which lead the rioters, the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen and the Committee of Chinese Labor. The leadership of both organizations will be invited to meet with the Chief Executive and Chief Secretary. We must hope that they are willing to co co be cooperate uh, with us, or else the situation will continue to spiral downwards. Snap inspections. Wong Ho Fai. Uh, sometime a minor bureaucrat, and another time a financial inspector from the Guangdong State Police. Uh, he declared he wanted to break from the ardor of financial audits and took over a government inspector's shift after he took ill. Driving the factory in the compound of Wano Kurma, a small factory owner known for his labor rights violation, even after Mori Tokyo had personally taken him to task in the early days of the regime, he rode down his window, nodded Officer to Lam, the policeman leading the convoy that had escorted him to the factory. Lam nodded back and pointed forward. The inner gates of the factory compound were barricaded, or at least Okuma clearly thought they were. But Lam took one look, snorted, and raised the Sony branded bullhorn to his mouth. Mr. Okuma, as the Guangdong Police escorting State Inspector Ishida Shintaro to inquire into the conduct of your business, we advise you to immediately dismount your barricades unless you want us to force an entry and seize any and all pertinent evidence, up and to including factory machinery. At that, a loud curse swiftly cut off was heard, and the doors were debarricaded de and opened in short order. The owner relented, but not without protest, as it turned out. When Okuma saw Wong, he began to complain. Why aren't you inspecting Hitachi? Don't you know they're violating labor laws on, the, on their face right now? Oh, really, Wong was dismissive. Stop spotting nonsense, sir. Other people's viol violations don't free you from an enforcement action, but 
In the heart of his heart, he knew the little answer to the man's question. It was because Itachi had gotten to get up and fire on the police. Well, that would really suck. All gone. Yamauchi Hiroshi uh, leaned nervously on the metal railings of a perch atop the Nintendo factory, gazing upon the workers at their stations. Uh, crafting and assembling Nintendo products, there used to be more here, he thought to himself, counting the number of workers on the ground and glancing at the full list of employees on the clipboard he held in his hands. The symphony of the machinery that once amazed him was nothing but a quiet whimper as the sound of thick paper sheets being cut into cards barely even reached him anymore. The men, men women, uh, Chinese, and Japanese that once worked so harmoniously with each other were no longer there at the workstations collecting dusk. Himachi sighed. A modest man clad in blue different to the white most workers wore approached him, and the sound of his boots on the metal railings drowning out of the ready soft hum of machinery. Good morning, Mr. Yamauchi. The man greeted, extending his hand. Ah, oh, you must be the supervisor. Yamauchi replied, shaking his hand. Where have all the workers gone? There's barely even a skeleton crew here, and we're not even meeting the minimum daily output anymore. Yamauchi pointed the noticeably uh, factory floor below them. Well, I don't really know that much either, sir. The supervisor solemnly nodded. One day it was one worker gone, the next it was five. By the end of the week, half the staff just stopped showing up. I tried to prove prod anything and see what happened, but no one wants to tell me anything. He scoffs nervously, taking off his hard hat. Himachu quickly ran through the list of his clipboards to see how many union-affiliated employees were gone. The union, they must be behind this. God, they can never be satisfied, thought to himself. The union, have you checked with them? Are they striking? Himachu snapped, putting down the clipboard. Well, uh, like I said, sir, no one wants to tell me anything, but I don't think this is a union thing. If they were, if it was, they would have left all at the same time and made demands already. Something bigger is brewing. The supervisor replied, glancing at the floor below him. What's happening in the city anymore? Here's the government despair. Cool. There you go. Decrease strength, decrease radicalism. Okay with that one too. By the leadership, let them vent. Some of the more reckless corporate leaders have been keen to call for a blanket clampdown on the dissent which has emerged. Following this course of action, will no doubt be misguided. The grievances of the people must, must be aired. After all, uh, <clears throat> their outrage against Hitachi disasters is perfectly understandable. We cannot push too hard against them, or they'll snap and turn the rage on Hitachi to us. Uh, and then normal's not enough. Well, just as we thought that the situation could not get any worse, it did. We expected the rise to slowly dissipate as time went by, but it seems the reverse is true, and that rise both grew in strength and radicalism for each passing day. The situation has gone far what we call normal, and has to be sorted out quickly and returned to normalcy. As stated previously, the normal effort that we put into containment is no longer adequate. In order to sort the situation um, as rapidly as possible, more state resources must be focused into taking control of the situation, more police, security, and riot police must be unleashed to put down the riot. We'll be willing to take far more drastic measures to stop the riots at any cost. Oh. Fruitless endeavor. Oh boy, this is really bad. Murita Stanley Hill and Commissioner Mori watched morosely from the two behind... Behind a two-way mirror as a handcuffed, bloody prisoner was manhandled into a folding chair, uh, sitting forlornly in a concrete interrogation room. Murder shifted uneasily at the sight, but it compelled himself to stay. Lee was enduring his far worse, attending to his son's shattered legs in the hospital. He didn't know if he'd seen the body of Yu Ming, though perhaps it was better if he didn't. Memory, in this case, would be far kinder than reality. I'd try to get him to talk, Stanley spat, but the man's not local. Had to be, get creative. And they're a grunt, Commissioner Morris said, hanging his head in frustration. They won't know much. Murder bit his lip, no organizational structure, no list of potential backers would be found. Nothing beyond the obvious fact that a Chinese man had murdered Lee's wife and maybe some. The scraping of a metal door cut Murray to slot short as Lee shuffled into the room with an unsteady gait. I want a moment with that uh, crap stain alone, Lee muttered, put into a shaking finger at the prisoner. Don't do this, uh, Kishing, uh, Murray to venture, reaching out to support Lee's shaking frame. What do you know, Lee batted, batted Murray to send away. None of you lost your flesh and blood. I need to know why, how, before, before. Lee's eyes lost focus, his body unspooling itself limply like a marionette without strings. Instantly, Murita rushed over to catch him, even as Amori walked towards the interrogation room with a single instruction. No cameras, this stays between us, but weakness once exposed can never be hidden again. Lee Kishin and his family's life shattered, and his own people killed his love. Losing descent against the government will become more numerous. I'm pretty sure he wants to probably kill as many as he possibly can now. I know I probably would. God, that's terrible. I did not read that one before. That's different from what I've read before, so that's interesting. Uh... We got a little bit of political power here. Maybe we could uh, do anything else here. Maybe no. Yes. I don't want any more corruption, though. I don't. I don't. I don't want to lower our GDP growth either. 70, 65 is okay. 63 is not great. Demands of the people. After a while, it became impossible to ignore. No matter how hard one tried, every street in Hong Kong had a poster on it. They were on the fronts of buildings, gates, telephone poles, cars, and anything and everything that could possibly be covered by them. They were a white algae that coated the entire city in four uh, uh, word slogans. You couldn't close your eyes to it either. Those same slogans on the posters were shouted at full volume in the innumerable protests and marches that were on seemingly every single hour. Even if you were in tall buildings like Murray Takeo was, the whole noise was very much so audible. 
And there was a violence. Every single day, the chief executive uh, received lurid reports detailing clashes between police and protesters. It didn't take long before he realized that the riots were taking a serious toll in Guangdong. If their objective was to make their demands clearer, he thought they had done their job. Some time had passed since the riots began enough to reconsider carefully whether it was worth responding to them or not. It was not. It was certainly worth at least thinking about it, the chief executive thought, since more than enough blood has been shed already. The riots were disabled in Guangdong by the second, and if talking to the protesters could help bring an end to all this, well then why not? On the one, on the other hand, negotiations and failing would be even worse. A broken promise would be even worse than making no promises at all. And there's no telling how the like go reverse Japan would react if word got out that they were talking to the radicals. Murtikyo gave it some more thought. A difficult decision looms. So we can negotiate pretty naturally. This is more so. So we we negotiate with these guys. Uh, GFT is pretty not. It's not too bad. But then trying to negotiate with these guys, that's gonna be pretty darn difficult. And trying to dismantle it would be um, not easy. But we do have a cup of tea here. Some ginseng guava tea, so we'll take a uh, minor moment to save. And see what we can do here. If we can get rid of one first, that's always good. So we'll probably try to do the normal way of negotiating with these guys. Cutting a deal. Well, it ends the riots. That's all. That thought of Anna to kill his mind more than a few times, while the entire government scrambled to deal with the worst crisis in Guangdong's history. It was initially at a volume, just above a whisper, but it grew ever loud as it became increasingly clear that the riots would not magically disappear. It was remarkably tempting. They would have to make some concessions to the protesters, of course, which would prove troublesome, but hopefully they would only be minor ones, and then all of the chaos would be over and the business could return to normal. Despite the very late hour, many of the government's highest officials were then huddled in the office to discuss the matter. They put on brave faces, as though from the slouched shoulders and slightly dipped heads one could tell they were all exhausted. The chief executive addressed one of them. Go over it again, Igarashi, one more time. Igarashi Masato, the government's de designated negotiator, stood in his tie and cleared his throat. Yes, well, of course. Once we begin negotiations, the protesters will expect that we come to some sort of agreement with them. It's absolutely critical that we get this right the first time. We'll probably not get a second chance. Ultimately, the decision's up to you, Chief Executive. Should we begin negotiations? Back out, you can start in 10 days. Be careful. Riders, for them to accept a weak proposal, the radicalism and strength must be low. For Leko to accept significant concessions, government despair must be high, and Japan's frustration may invariably will increase. <clears throat> you can back out before sending your initial proposal. Once your initial proposal is sent, there's no turning back. So we have a better proposal, but let's talk about under the radar. The office building in Central Coast were deserted after sundown, and Wong Se Wai scanned the darkened alleyways and scattered vehicles for any sign of undercover police. An unnaturally slow moving vehicle or a seemingly listless man on the errant bench. It seemed unreal that he'd been let through the specified police checkpoints simply by handing them a note he had received a few days earlier. He was clearly out of his place. If his factory overall is wholly unnatural, where tailored suits were the norm, and the riots had made much of Inokoshi a no go zone for the leaders of the Guangdong uh, Federation of Tradesmen. He was allowed to be into the specified office block without harassment, escorted to a nondescript conference room by two suited men with Matsushita lapel pens. When the door opened, there was no waiting police, inter police interrogation, only the graying figure of Matsushita Masaharu and nobody else. All of you seen that we are good for our word. Matsushita equipped, standing and offering his hand despite everything, the government is willing to talk. I see, Wong replied neutrally, touching Matsushita's hand for only a second. We're hoping to see the chief executive or the chief secretary. And you might still. Matsushita countered, wiping his hands on his trousers, if there is a unified position that we can, I can bring to them. And what happens if there's no such uh, unified position? Wong stared down Matsushita across the table. As both men stood in the flickering fluorescent glow of the ceiling light, Matsushita narrowed his eyes, but eventually relented, taking a seat for motioning Wong to do the same. They will continue meeting until you have one. So what do we got here? Let's read about this first. To end the negotiations by, uh, and the riots by negotiation, must craft a proposal. Ten possible provisions to add, each one more radical than the last. The proposal needs to consider the bargaining power of the chosen rider group through their strength and radicalism, as well as what Leko is willing to pass, uh, based on government despair, so... Apologize and change of course acknowledging fault. Individual accountability. Oh, that'd be good. Restitution. Penance is two things. To acknowledge sin and to make amends. We have the money to spare. Retraining and social welfare. Ever stop another conf conflagration from consuming Guangdong into the future? We must make investments in the people today. Ranging from offering new training to the civil service and expansion of disability pay and education allowance and then state ombudsman. If the people no longer trust the government to act in their interests, they will offer them an ombudsman to act as an observer. But we must demand that our perspective must be considered. An independent one, though. Is, is uh, the ombudsman's proposal is to be uh, give it actual, rather than nominal, independence. A legal representation for the government and dissident activists. Affirmative action. The right to unionize. Protective status. Privileged advocate, huh? Where wrong has been done, action must be taken to make things right. It stands to reason, then, that grievous wrongs demand radical action. Huh. Chief Executive will pledge to extend privileged advocate status to the dissident group in question, a political dispensation to extend state backing and resources in a case where demands or address is a priority, ensuring the Zhujin and Chinese can defend themselves in the court system, which is otherwise heavily stacked in favor of the corporations. 
Let's go with this one. The Olive Branch on this proposal, which we have worked so very hard on, is the center of a commitment to the future of Guangdong. We sincerely hope that all of your concerns will be addressed. Yes, we come from very different perspectives, but we both want peace and stability in Guangdong. As long as we begin from that point, I'm confident that we will eventually come to an agreement. Thank you. The pleasant trees came and went quickly, since there was no love lost between the government and the protesters. Chief negotiator Igarashi Masato had just finished presenting the government's proposal in a cold hotel meeting room, and remained standing as he awaited a response. The protesters exchanged whispers between them for a few seconds, and the leader stood up. His reply was short and direct, his tone terse and assertive. <clears throat> While we have some shared interests, we also make sure they review every point of our proposal. Thank you. <clears throat> the protesters' delegation then gathered in another corner of the meeting room, lowering their voice to prevent being heard. As a low, indistinct grumbling went on, Garashi tried to eavesdrop on the conversation, managing to grasp snatches of it. Here and there, fragments that were enough to make him go and the rest of the negotiation team sweat. Uh, really want. I'm telling you, this is nowhere near enough. Very far apart right now. This reads more like a document of surrender. This went on for more than a few minutes, so it felt longer, and the leader stood up again, bringing the current session to an end. We'll need some more time to review your proposal, but we'll be in touch soon. Hey, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Discreet inquiries. There was one subject in the riots that everyone around Chief Executive Marita Keo was steadfastly refusing to voice a lot, even if everyone thought it was more than possible. The Ch Republic of China, never friendly to Guangdong's existence, had kept its public statements limited to calling for the protection of Chinese citizens in Guangdong. Their staff had been a thorn in the side of the government claiming constant privileges over Chinese nationals, gumming up investigations seemingly random. And what if the interventions by the Chinese weren't random? What if, in addition to consular assistance, the Chinese had decided to vent their displeasure with Guangdong through other more or less active interference? The motives and opportunity were present, all that remained were the means. Quietly, the police made as many safe, undeniable queries as they could considering the consulate's recent activities. They wouldn't take the first step in the diplomatic minefield that will surely result from the full investigation, but it wouldn't be but it would be negligent to not lay the foundations ahead of time. What are the Chinese up to? The government now has the option to investigate the Chinese Consulate General's role in the Guangdong riots via the riots decision category. Of course, an investigation into something this explosive may have some severe consequences if mishandled. I love tea. No, well, maybe I don't love it, but I enjoy it. Backing. Still wouldn't be bad to do, I and mean, we are maxed out. Approval's okay. Wait, where's the riots option? Oh, we can investigate the Chinese Consul General. Because they're never done whether or not the Chinese are aiding the rioters, so how deep their support goes. If you suspect the Republic of China that are interfering in the riots, so it may be worth investigating the Consul General, but there'll be severe consequences if we are wrong. Speak to the Japanese Consul General. Venture investors. Eh. Oh, we could save again, just in case. Because remember, investigating the Chinese would be very, very bad for us. So let's go through everything first, maybe. I wonder if we can negotiate successfully without any stuff with China. That's not bad. That's not bad. We're doing okay. Keep working on that academic base, too. As we let them vent. It's fine. It's fine. Ah. You know what? 2%? We'll go with that for now. Let's start with something new. There wasn't much to do for next for Chief Negotiator Igarashi and his team other than to wait anxiously. Even the protesters' delegation ind indicated their willingness to turn on the table, it was still remarkably nerve-wracking. The first thing Igarashi noticed when he saw the protesters' representatives again was that there were fewer of them than before. Between a quarter to a third of the members didn't return, seemingly upset. At what, it was unclear. Where the meeting began, their leader read from the clearly prepared script, Igarashi prepared for the worst. After extensive consultations with the leaders and grassroots, we're prepared to make a decision. Based on what we have seen, our movement has decided to accept your government's proposal, he said, and the entire government negotiating team immediately relaxed, letting out breaths they didn't know they were holding. Some couldn't even resist cracking a smile, others began thinking of how they would celebrate later that night, probably with the copious amounts of alcohol. But the protesters' leader wasn't interested in them letting them relax, and his next words were to stern, delivering unsmiling. Do not think that this is the end. Talk is cheap, we have had enough of your empty, unfulfilled promises. We expect concrete, tangible action to be taken by your government. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. And that would have to be up to the luck, Igarashi thought. That would be the only way to convince them that we mean what we say. But that's a good start, at least. Your proposal will not be sent to let go where you have to pass before it comes into force. The most important week. Still over two political power days. Pretty darn nice. Not gonna lie. Oh, is this one? Divert research away from the CCL, huh? Uh, probably not. The itching plague. It was a quiet night in the barracks, a short ways outside the heart of urban chaos, something considered a minor, minor tragedy to those inside. If the horizon was not exactly clear, nothing was coming towards Private Hirano's guard post. Not a sound, not a single darn soul coming to receive punishment. His hands, desperately seeking a solution to their discomfort, wandered over his rifle. Fingers brushing against his intricately crafted machine of death, funneling the guard around the trigger, but unable to pull it. The order. <clears throat> 
had not come. It sounds were not at the end of a flood of bullets. His boots were not nestled deep in the shattered skulls. There was only the sound of undisturbed leaves, of disturbed leaves outside, and the scratching within. Oh, whoops. I chose the wrong one. God dang it. I wanted this one. Oh, well. Lights kind of come out already, so Kota continues scraping away with his flashlight. The rest of the barracks do not complain, themselves busy in similar projects. He taken to avoiding wearing his eye patches of late, and so the pale mechanical glow it cast into the reddish black pit. Or visions lurk no more. Only an infernal, never ending itch. He ignored it too to focus on his task. Supposedly, these rounds were now stable, out of prototyping. Good, as night flashed on and on in the limited night, carving names of previous hex of which the chief executive had sent them to shoot their barely functional toy guns. Of the true names of the disgusting mass, as the chief executive had failed to pacify while they were sent away. All five companies, over whose decadence the chief executive resided. And of course, several of the chief, uh, the chief executive instead, just in case he missed. Um, concluding another uneventful staff meeting, Nagano shook the last man's hand and sat back at his desk. The unassigned order lingered in front of him, as it always did, soon but, soon, but not yet. As he considered packing up and leaving for the day, he noticed the continued ghostly sensation of the last man's hand in his. A parading itch, but one which could not yet be scratched. Japan and the IJ Garrison is considering direct measures are needed to quell the riots. And surely maintain the confidence you or matters may be taken out of your own hands. Oh, there goes that guy. Goodbye. The most important week. Look, do you do not understand how important this is? I know it's difficult, but we must pass this bill at any cost. And unless people like you both work, Guangdong will collapse. Have you even read it? This isn't a deal considering what we're giving them. It might as well be called the Surrender Act. Guangdong will collapse if we take this so called deal, if not reject it. Elusibility. Um, <clears throat> the hall was just outside the doors of the Legco, where animated a buzz with activity even at such an early hour. Many were holding well-born paper copies of the proposal in their hands, most were engrossed in the quick-fire conversations about the document's contents. All of them understood the intense pressures on the council to deliver a result. Two main camps emerged, some were critical, and the attacks came in thick and fast on every jot and title, ranging from the somewhat skeptical to the completely apoplectic. Ap apoplectic. At the same time, one could just as easily find those who defended the bill as best they could get, and there were numerous passionate advocates who argued for the proposal as if their lives depended upon it. When the doors of the chamber opened a few minutes before proceedings began, the legislature fil filed in without a moment's hesitation, taking their seats without delay. On top of the schedules, four black blocky words said, Vote in ten days. The upcoming vote would be one of the most important in their lives, if not the most important, and they'd have less than two weeks to make their decision. A barrage of questions was prepared by all lawmakers, ready for the moment the floor was open. There would be no time to waste, the speaker was walked up to the dais, tapped the mic, and said the bill has now been introduced. Debate may commence. They introduced a compact with the GFT bill in the let go, in ten days, instead of the usual thirty. Due to the various value of the proposal, the government despair will receive 55 votes in favor. So, because if we do this, what do we get? More Zhujin support, way less Japanese expat support. More Chinese support, way less Japanese support. Decreases Hitachi seats by two, which is fine. Poverty will begin to slowly improve, increase social costs by half a billion. GFT Compact, the apology and restitution of the GFT will be added to our laws, as well as state's ombudsman. Daytime in Macau. It was near the place once called Owlman, and the people had awoken. The two protesters, one Chinese, one Zhujian, marched in the midday seat as a brain beat down on their heads. The heat might have dissuaded them from carrying on with the work. Were they from climates, it might equally have demotivated them, were they not protesting for the rights? Look at that. Yeah, it, it, that was not the case. It was time for the people of occupied Guangdong to rise and make clear that neither Japanese imperialism nor the role of Sony Corporation had them. The energy of the fellow protesters sustained them through the heat and humidity as they marched through the concrete Macau jungle. Suddenly, however, a problem emerged. A police barricade, one on several on the way to the Macau government complex, their eventual destination. The protesters looked at one another. Would they have to stop or take a detour? Might the police force them to break down? Might... Wait a moment, what was that? Were the police clear in the barricade? They were. The crowd roared. The police pulled back and the barricade dismounted, and the crowd roared as they passed through the once blocked off zone. The scots were treating with kid gloves. They were clearly reluctant to d double down on their old mistakes. All the better for the protesters. That meant they were free to force Guangdong to listen to them. The power that freedom gave them was intoxicating. So they're going to lose 10% support anyway, so... This costs a lot of political power here. We can do all three and get some political power back. Oh, that's not good. That's actually really not good. There you go. Oh, that makes me a little worried. We're almost done up for when you're desperate. Almost involuntarily, Morita Kale rubbed his eyes again, realizing that after he'd done it for the second time in three minutes. How many weeks have been since he've had a proper tonight's rest? He glanced at the table clock. It was 4 a.m. the dead of night, and the entire city coach was fast asleep. In truth, he hadn't noticed it was asleep. slave. From the noise, he could tell the negotiations and informal vote counting were just as frenzied as when it began in the morning, but the days were fluttering by quickly, too quickly, and soon it would be time to vote on the proposal. Despite the government's best efforts, there were still many recalcitrants in the Litco. The vote could come well down to the wire. As an eight old old idea came to the front of the chief executive's mind, to be precise, there were two plentiful solutions to the problem. It was always the option to twist the people's arms. 
The government could, with more of a bit of pressure, strong on the bill's opponents into voting for it instead. Others could be convinced by tea money, provided the government was willing to provide enough of it. Given the stakes, however, the cost of taking either option would be nothing short of extortionate. Not to mention that this would essentially supercharge corruption in Guangdong. Uh, Marita K.O. pondered the options in front of him. Yeah, so it was exorbitant, but the government might just have to bite the bullet and take it. Whatever it takes. Now we have what we need. We're fine. Oh, wow, that's not good. Because of negative GDP growth. God dang it. Raise expectations. Work stoppages, industrial sabotage, wanton property damage. Japanese Consul General Takashima Masuo threw down three separate folders onto the coffee table separating him from Morita Akeo and Lee Kishin. None of this is pleasant reading for Tokyo, you understand. And if that's foreign mystery opinion, General Nagano Shigeto added, his expression barely hiding a snarl under his khaki uniform's high collar, I'm sure you can imagine how the army's reacting. The atmosphere in the Consul General's office was frigid, with Consul General Takashima's disapproval pairing seamlessly with General Nagano's wilting disdain. Morita felt a slight sweat forming on his palms and his brow, but it resisted the urge to wipe even a drop of it away. The situation is pr proving more challenging than expected, Morita said, parsing his words carefully. We retain full con confidence in the ability of the local police to match the situation, so the protest groups can be separated and dealt with separately. Tokyo certainly hopes so, Nagano replied. Despite everything going on elsewhere in the sphere, I have ordered the army garrison to remain at high and alert. At that, everyone, including the consul general, shot a surprised glance at General Nagano, whose expression of disdain remained unchanged. Morita heard his own breathing sharpen involuntarily. He saw Ali gripping his arms of his chair tightly, his knuckles shaking faintly against the uh, polished wood. Stability is interest of both Tokyo and your investors, Consul General Takashima interjected, shooting a point of glare at General Nagano, so for all our sakes, you need to get this under control. And, but the council does approve. A small man, some executive former to Chaos Company, who had been granting the right to vote to tally, or the right to, right to tally, walked up to the podium in the center of the council floor. They stood at the podium, watching the crowd of executives and waiting for them to be quiet, finally gave a short statement to the microphone. The vote passes. The negotiations with the dissents, dissent, dissidents can now be put into effect. The conversation crashed to a, halt, to a halt across the room as each man considered the weight of the moment. For those who had pushed forth the agreement, there could be celebration later. For those who had fought back, seething and fuming, yet for the moment the room could be united in shock. As the moment set in, the initial shock gave way to quiet concern and jittery contemplation of what might come next. This news, thus far, had only gone as far as the room. Soon to make his way through the Guangdong and beyond, beholden to the judgment of every executive, officer, general, or worker, and most importantly, every protester who pledged themselves to be to the other protester group. The world will soon re react to the news, and the world is rarely kind of Guangdong. A shot in the dark is still a shot. Oh, that actually lowered poverty. Well, that's not good. Um, find our allies. Serve the changes. Increases decreases growth further. Increases the strength of the CCL. Incorporate the manifestos. Limit coordination. Isolate the troublemakers. Raise a black flag. Honestly, I think I'm going to balance it out here and go this way. I like increasing government control. And I don't want to decrease Japanese uh, influence either. And increase admin costs, that's okay with us. And we have quite a bit of Chinese and Zuzian support. So, maybe I say the troublemakers? How much Japanese support do we have? Also here. Nothing we can do there yet. 61% is not much. China loves us. I really don't want to lower our seats anymore. Hmm. Now let's isolate him. I've taken to the count of several occasions during the crisis. The protesters were very divisive or diverse in their terms of beliefs and goals. While simply wishing to express their discontent with the circumstances they are in, there are some that are more unsavory than the rest of them. These be these are the people that don't want to express their displeasure, and so looking to cause anarchy, stir trouble, and in general destabilize the state of Guangdong. The people that we cannot reason with, and treating them in the same way as we treat the rest of the protesters is a simply mistake. Instead, they must be eliminated from the picture as soon as possible. Please will focus on isolating their influence from spreading so as to not attract any more people to the cause. Daytime raids? Why not? Despite all the efforts by security forces to quietly and carefully suppress the radicals that have thrown Guangdong into chaos, it's clear this strategy is not working. Now it's attempted policy deterrence. Dayta daylight raids and investigations and hotspots of radical activity will be approved, both to arrest as many of the subversives as we can, as well as show the people that will not tolerate revolutionaries in our midst. Security status, tenuous. As a president, Guangdong has entered a state of chaos unheard of since the immediate period following the War of Liberation. Entire sectors of urban uh, uh, centers appear to have come under the sway of dissident groups. While well, the Aqaba zones cannot be evenly split between the politically oriented or terrorists and the criminal elements, both organized and disorganized, 
Momentum appears to lie in the hands of illicit Chinese labor organizations. Disturbances have been less severe in rural areas, which is believed to be the result of poor communications infrastructure and a sparse or decreasing population. Despite these pressing concerns, the actions of the chief executive do not appear to match the severity of the situation, despite the obvious economic and social detriment caused by the continued inaction, and thus the legitimacy of Guangdong itself that are so far proving unable or unwilling to resolve the situation correctly. Domestic security personnel, with assistance from the Camp Baitai, while currently able to contain the significant spread of urban violence, has thus far proven inadequate to breach and neutralize centers of unrest. Heavy assistance is requested. Communications with Tokyo and IJ High Command have thus far proven sporadic. While agreeing with local command on the severity of the situation, they continue to vest powers of suppression within Guangdong civilian infrastructure, or in institutions. Another protest has been issued, but present orders remain to observe and wait for the instructions, and Pyrrhal 23rd Army Department of Communications and those who leave. For those in the streets, the news of successful negotiations brought a weight off their shoulders, and the marchers across Guangdong have shouted a success from the bullhorns, broke the, from the picket lines, and took down their sons and went home. They walked away of the terrorist crackdowns and investigations and returned with a victory. Not all accepted so easily, though. For many, the terms felt too light, too minor, and too easily sidestepped to truly protect the Chinese workers, but for many, they trusted their leaders, their negotiators. They believed in what the comrades had built, or at least what that was the best that could be given in the circumstances. You know, the ranks of the dissidents did not swell with joy, far from it. Even their happiest members still carried a faint concern in their hearts that they might have done a little bit more. Whether they turned to families, to good friends, or lives suspended by the terrors of the riots, they turned alive and safe, and with the hope that their next day at work might be a, bit, a little bit dangerous. Less dangerous. And I believe that Guangdong might have grown up fair, hair fairer. So, we passed by the GFT, decreased rider strength, and decreased rider radicalism. Because we dealt with the GFT, the CCL strength and radicalism takes have increased. Increased the government control, more political power, decreases the government despair by 60%. And those who remain. Nice. So what do we got now? Uh, can we negotiate with them? What do we got here? We got four things here. Display anti-CCL riot police. Decrease growth, decrease strength, decrease Japanese frustration. Dispersing a riot with a loud speaker usually goes nowhere. Dispersing a riot with a nice stick and a riot show has proven to be far more effective. The current situation calls for a latter approach. Well, decrease the Jap Japanese uh, concern. 51% is pretty high. It's got some willing to bear right now. Increase government control, decrease the strength, decrease Japanese uh, so. CCL checkpoint monitoring. Be uh, increasing checkpoint security to limit the flow of people in and out of certain districts will allow us to consolidate government control and potential hotbeds of dissident activity. Issue pro protest permits. Can we negotiate with these guys too? Well, if it ends, yeah? yeah sure, why not? We will. Let's go with omnipendent. Woodsman. All the branches of the skin, please go ahead. 33%, where are we at? That's not good. That's really bad. Those remain. For the remaining protesters, there is no joy upon the news of successful negotiations. In March across Guangdong, they watched as the former allies shouted success from their bullhorns. Uh, Bull Rogue from the picket lines uh, took on their signs and went home. They left their allies on the cold to follow the path of perish. Those who remained in the street did not falter. They were not excited by the newfound agreement. They were horrified. In their eyes, the protesters had given up for the mere trinkets and offices. The question was left on the tongue of every protester. Had their allies always aimed to force themselves on the machines of Guangdong, or had they grown so demented it seemed that like there was no other way? And the cabins on the streets of Koshu, and their homes in the outskirts of the state. The protesters cursed old friends and laid salt to their path. They would not err as their allies had. There would be no second negotiations unless the world itself was overturned. So this will increase radicals by no more but strength and government despair and Japanese frustration, huh? Start something new. Uh, let's see. The proposal will be set to local order to pass before it comes into force. Oh god dang it. Uh, if you want to this one, please go ahead. This we're probably not gonna get it to pass. Yeah. So this one's probably going to take us a while to get done. Well, 
most important week. If you want to do this, please go ahead. Yeah. By moonlight, it's strange to see the factory like this. Uh, in the darkness of the night, with the building normal sea, normally full of light and sound and sw sweat, seemed to loom naturally over the seascape around it. The moonlight stretching its shadow over the street to the building opposite. Four men in black use that use use that shadow for covers they made for the padlock gate factory gate. Slipping to the, up to the gate, one of the men used a pair of bolt cutters to break the lock, careful to make as little noise as possible. Once inside the gate, the men split up without saying a word. The plan had been intensely rehearsed, for they each knew the factory inside and out. From outside the factory, it was hard to tell at first what was going on. An orange glow came from some of the windows, and at first it seemed like somebody turned on the lights inside. It was only when the black smoke coming came pouring out that the truth became obvious. It took the fire crews hours to snuff out the blaze, by which point the factory had been completely gutted, and several nearly but nearby buildings had been badly damaged. The four men were nowhere to be found. They said, look back into the night. Yeah. Uh, it's not gonna pass at all. It would be nice if we could, but it's not going to. But it's what we got here. So we'll have to redo that one. Daylight raids, let's read about that. And then screen public transport. Most of the demonstrators could not afford their own means of transportation, so it just happens that we ourselves provide the means of gathering for these troublemakers. Public transportation systems have been observed to be utilized by demonstrators looking to either reach for their intended protest location or organize their fellow demonstrators. Services such as the public buses and train systems have been reported to carry passengers possessing questionable gear with them. To prevent them from further gathering the strength or further organizing, we we'll take measures to screen the public transportation system. Anyone carrying stones, homemade explosives, or anything else that may be used to disrupt peace on the streets shall be detained before they can ground up, uh, the, group up with the masses. Divide and conquer. Raise the black flag. So at the beginning of the demonstrations, we have enacted a policy of tolerance towards the demonstrators, and the protesters were already encouraged to engage in peaceful acts of demonstration instead of violence, and we have hoped that this situation would not escalate any further. We've been proven wrong. The protesters have started to become more violent and destructive, far exceeding what we or our investors consider the limit. More and more destruction and disruption. I've erupted in the streets of Guangdong, and the country is inching closer to anarchy for every second is not addressed. Enough is enough. They have been warned, and yet they remain ignorant. Bring out the tear gas, raise the black flags. Guangdong must be saved from these vandals. No difference. Yeah, Yao yeah, said goodbye to his partner. Her partner, Chan, as he left her their home in the city once known as Xiaoguan. He said it was going to a meeting of local martial arts groups, but he should... He, she knew what was really going on. He was headed to a daytime protest of the Committee of Chinese Labor. Not that Yao mind, of course. She was not one to carry water for the guy, chief executive over in Guangzhou. One of the things that held the relationship together was Yao and Chan's mutual admiration for and support of the CCO's goals. As Yao said about her day, she knew that she couldn't expect Chan to make it back until evening, of course. That was hardly a problem as such, seeing as how everyone knew by now that nothing dangerous really was happening during the daytime hours. We support the CCO, but we are on the front line in, say, Guangzhou, so we're probably safe, she said. It was not a coping mechanism, but a realistic understanding of the situation. It was a shame. The circumstances would change that understanding within hours. At noon, Chan came back tripping over her his own feet, breathing raggedly with his closed horn. Yao took one look at him and turned pale. The first question was asked, what? The police, Chan's panic answer cut her off. Already a warning sign, Chan never cut her off unless something was very wrong, and worse yet, he kept babbling. They came after they got the warehouse, I barely got away. Yao nodded and gave Chan a hug. Well, if you got away, there's nothing else for it. Let's get you freshened up. Chan willingly huddled in his partner's arms. But an instant knock began at the door, and shouts of police were distinctly audible. There's no difference between day and night now. Counterattack. Lam Tsushin, a Sushin officer worker protesting in Hong Kong, was filled with the usual protesters' zeal facing the usual police blockade with a typically large, typically angry group of protesters in front of the customary major police barricade. As was the norm, the policemen were blocking them from advancing down the thoroughfare once known as Nathan Road, blaring the regular warnings as oh, it's always the case. By decree of the chief executive, citizens are hereby ordered to disperse. We have issued warnings twice already and are now making clear that any further advance will not be will be tolerated, and so on. Obviously, this is all hot air. The protesters thought, as always, until something changed. A line of officers donned gas masks and raised a black flag over their heads. That's cool. This meant warning tear smoke. But the meaning became pretty clear soon enough. All normalcy dissipated as the tear canisters soared over the group, settled among them, and then, and then nobody cared much about anything else at all. New day, new work. Every morning brought new tasks to the residents of Zhujian Park. A gaggle of volunteers prepared soup on portable gas stoves in a corner of the park converted into an impromptu field kitchen, making sure to keep enough distance from each other to minimize the risk of fire. The night patrols filed back in one group at a time to hand over their duties to the morning shift. Though the police had vacated this corner of Maumei nearly two weeks ago, they had evacuated the city entirely until they did. The patrols would provide enough warning for a more organized defense. Several men were carried on on stretchers, having suffered bruises or broken arms overnight. A few had uh, simply take, fall, taken a fall, bad fall in the night, tripping over an unattended block of concrete or twisting an ankle when navigating a burnt-out protest barricade. Others have been involved in nighttime melee with guards to prove it. Laundry, maintenance, sanitation, communication, the list was endless, giving everyone in the district something to do. A few would cry, half jokingly, that their deliberation simply gave them more work to do, but it was more meaningful than anything else they had done on behalf of the corporate masters, the taste of freedom. And now we could investigate the Chinese consulate. Now we could negotiate with them, but the government despair isn't still high enough yet, it's only 13%. Japanese concerns are growing, but we could try to dismantle them. But well, launch an investigation, but to do that, we need to investigate the Chinese too. Perhaps.
as we are doing screen public transports. So, what are your eyes on? In the dim light of sunset, Chief Executive Maria Kia furtively selected a nondescript folder from the stack upon his desk and assuming every form before a single deliberate scribble at the top of the corner. There's no shortage of police documentation review these days, but and while that provided sufficient cover for the folder in question, it ensures folder didn't end up in the wrong hands. The reason was immediately clear from the first line and close text. Recommendations for observation. Consul the General of the Republic of China for the Chief Executive's eyes only. Even reading those two lines was enough to make Maria Takeo's eyes shoot to the door and then out of the window for fear of prying eyes. Suspicion about the Chinese government's role in the riots was commonplace. Less common was for suspicion to be voiced, let alone put on paper. After a deep breath, the city's hand. Maria Takeo's eyes slipped through the memorandum, absorbing its complaints or contents as quickly as he dared. There were several avenues for investigation, scoping out the motivations and official communications of the Consul General, finding material evidence of the support for the Committee of Chinese Labor, or building a profile around Consul General Song Ziguang and political attaché Wang Jingju. If the Chinese were truly stirring up the pot in Guangdong, there would be have to be some trail to follow. And if the Chinese were involved, and they caught the chief executive prying into diplomatic affairs, they would surely be held to pay. The motive of the Consul General's communications? Any material included CCL. But a profile on Consul General Song and Tashi Wang. Bring the files. Well, I can try this one. The more we know about Song and Wang, the easier we can expose them. Yeah. This one, I don't want to increase growth. Increase government despair. Decrease the strength. Increase Japanese expats control. That's fine. I'm not doing this one either. So. Anything here? No, but we still got to prepare for uh, eventually the. What is this? State says Guangdong budget. Oh, uh, the budget is hurting us. Um, what do you call it? The. Pfft. What the heck do we call it? Product cycle, duh. Prime suspects. Even the work of building the general case against the Chinese government and its agents in Guangdong was entrusted to the police, Chief Executive Marie Dikeo's thoughts wandered back to the two men who were going to be pulling the strings, Consul General Zhang Ziguang and Wang Jingwu. While the two men have been a known quantity in Guangdong for years, Song is a representative of the Chinese government and Wang is a attache directing Chinese intelligence operations in Guangdong. There were two enmeshed in Guangdong to feasibly claim ignorance of any subversive activities. Uh, but linking them conclusively to said activity uh, would be a different issue altogether. It struck Marie Takeo that it, perhaps he, unique among the members of the Guangdong's government and the tycoons of the four companies, had a perspective of the two men from years of interaction. If nothing else, those perspectives could be useful for the police to build a profile of Consul General Song and Otashi Wang. I can already do so at any rate. The more we know about him, the larger chance we find something uh, of substance. The more we know about him, the larger we can find something of substance. Let's go with Consul General Song first. What is this? There you go. Dasye Song Ziguang, born in Guangzhou, Republic of China, 1916. Educational attainment, bachelor's degree. Um, I delayed to the Greater East Asian War, completed after entering diplomatic service. Joined the military of, or Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1949. Diplomatic history. Uh, has gone all the way to different, different places. Chief Executive Moreta Kiel marveled at the trajectory of Song's career, picked to be Consul General by 48. Even if it was a country, China took every pain of snub when it could. Perhaps that had been the point. There were so few threads worth pulling, even in this truncated history. Why was Song returning to Guangdong in 1962? From the Republic of the Philippines. What did Song do during the war? Is there anything new in his previous postings? What did he do during the war? You know, there's a big old gap there, huh? Missing papers. The blank spots that marked the Consul General's fire from 37 to 48 were hardly unusual. The records of the old Chinese government, those that weren't burned, destroyed, or shredded by Chiang's regime, were otherwise lost to the corruption. Uh, chaos and general flux that marked the final years of war in China. Those that did survive were frequently left without an update, as many materials were consumed in the struggle for the Middle Kingdom. Only the living, both in paper and of life, had their lives to go on. A consul general would have been 21 when the Kwangtung army crossed the Yongting River. A university education placed on hold. Prime fighting age during the war, like so many others until his paper trail during those years vanished, reappearing in the records only when the dust had settled. Interesting. Blast from the past. Ah, the faux pas of asking what those from the Middle Kingdom had done during the war was one well learned by the Japanese officials stationed on the mainland, yet the consul general's office held clues as to where his whereabouts during those tumultuous years. The framed photographs of smiling young men of fatigue, one prominently displayed on his desk, the confidence and excitement that could only be possessed young men heading off to war. It was obvious in hindsight that Song had fought in the war. The question was for which side. It looked back to the record again, the splank spots from 37 to 48. If he had fought for Wang Jingwei's government, at least some would have been filled. The illogical conclusion that he had served on the other side. The presence of demobilized United Front soldiers in the RGOC was an open secret, yet the existence of such a figure in Guangdong remained a distasteful realization. Troubling revelations. Oh boy. Now, about him. Why was Song returned to Guangdong in 1962? Yeah, economic review of you know this, please go ahead. We want $77 billion. Well, I don't know if we can actually get that done. Guangdong Blues. 
Even amid the flux and instability that marked the early days of the new Guangdong administration, personal and family records could be traced if one was willing to look. Among the many things Guangdong lacked, it was not one of them. The immediate family of Zhang Jiguang was no longer resided within Guangdong's boundaries, but that in, in of itself was hardly room for suspicion. The mass movement of people during the war uprooted families and shattered communities, yet the consul general had always spoken fondly of his ancestral home, a love that, in his own words, no foreigner or immigrant would ever truly understand. There are biases of the nativists, perhaps, though the family history is traceable to at least the 30s. The history in the area well predates the oldest chief executive or the most tenured veteran of the IJA garrison. The man has made a point of turning three pearls and walking the streets on top of his official duties. Diplomat he may be, Koshu, or Guangzhou may he might say, his home, even if it walks it as a foreigner. Interesting, and remove the limiters. Just as we were thinking that the situation could not deteriorate even further, we received more and more reports on the streets of anarchy and destruction. It seems that our previous measures were not enough to deter the protests from intensifying, and instead, the protests have even amplified in intensity. There's no work, yet the people are not satisfied, even worse off. Our investi investors in Tokyo government have started to demand results of the de-escalation of the situation, and we have little, regard, little to know to show in that regard. The circumstances are desperate. And desperate times call for desperate measures. Anything that we've called, we've been holding back from doing in the past, we can do today. The limiters must be removed and the street must be pacified by any means necessary. The crisis on the street must be brought under control, even if they mean to shake us to our core. Yeah, you gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, look at this. We need more political power. With us or against us. You lose five seats, huh? Decrease a lot of growth. Increase Japanese ra uh, frustration. Selective enforcement. I like to increase his government despair, but it's not worth it for us. Increase the Sony's and Chung Kong's seats, but. Or I guess it's probably probably the better one to do. I want to decrease Japanese frustration, which would be good. This is the easy one to do or against us. Call them extremists, radicals, or even terrorists. These groups of people have made it clear to us that the priorities lie not for the sake of the future. They made it clear that they will not in any way or form join us marching into the future of Guangdong and instead help in a wrecking havoc and destruction of their homeland after, rather than preserving it. Let's make sure that they cannot destroy or threaten the well-being of anyone else or uh, other than themselves. Actions have consequences, and although they may be disguided, worthy of pity or simply had things differently from us, the truth is they know very well what they're doing. And chose to press on with a meaningless campaign. Their actions will grant them consequences. They shall not be spared from wrath. Purgation. Lao congratulated himself, as he's been doing ever since the riots began, for how smart he and his colleagues have been. At the beginning, when he and his other CCL men, cell men, then, of, mind you, not a few women, began their work, they had transported firebombs and cars and suitcases on foot. They had gone over all right just for three days until Wang and Xiao caught, caught, got caught with a bag carrying unsus, uh, suspected firebomb precursors and were thrown in prison for a night. Having failed, they tried something else. As the police began to crack down on the protests in the streets, the tears uh, smoke coming hard and fast, the recently released Wang noticed that the policemen weren't patrolling public transit at all. Uh, Cards, especially to get to the unmarked. Uh, oh, uh, use it. Uh, so, CO came up with a clever idea. Use private transport cars, especially to get to the unmarked warehouses where the firebombs were being made, then go to the front line with the firebombs on public transport. Lao mentally congratulated himself and CO on the idea, and as he had several times before. These minibuses were wonderful things, weren't they? And they were branded with Sony logos, too. Some of them, no better vehicle, didn't make a mockery of that guy that the chief executive and his friends over at Hitachi had been other. So, the minibus stopped just as it was about to start. Then, the quarter police officers burst in and say, See, open your bags. There's nothing bad in there, you've got nothing to fear. Did that all Lao say was all crap? As a realization, said what he was done for. Pride goes before a fall, after all. Uh, security status, uh, chaotic. Uh, the state of Guangdong continues to display a little sign of improvement and in many respects actively deteriorating. Despite our advice, the chief executive continues to be unable to produce results in line with the pan asian project within Guangdong or is pursuing goals outside the established understanding of said project. An urgent clarification of aims and policies is firmly recommended. Amidst political confusion emanating from the government complex, Guangdong's domestic security services have proven increasingly unable to contain the wall of trust or unrest, which is those of writing is overwhelmingly more sectors of the three pearls by the day. Camp Tai Command have repeatedly cont contacted the 404th Division for assistance, claiming that the Guangdong police force have proven too unreliable with which to operate effectively. Will orders from Tokyo prevent IJ personnel from confirming this hypothesis? Let's confirm that GF GPF are proving woefully inadequate as a peacekeeping force, particularly regarding dis discipline. Zhujin officers in particular appear to be a peculiar force for hate of the rioters, and their presence may exacerbate violence more than preventing it. Swift use of a discipline, majority Japanese fighting force to quell unrest is recommended. While well, orders from Tokyo remain to stand firm, growing concerns regarding the efficacy of Guangdong's current civilian leadership. As more and more productive centers fall under rider control, the economic benefits Guangdong offers at the cost of security have become increasingly fleeting as such. The Prime Minister reportedly believes in the long-term sustainability, and the legitimacy of the state of Guangdong may have ceased to exist. Should the Prime Minister choose to confirm these sentiments, the 23rd Army is prepared to agree in the strongest possible manner. Imperial uh, uh, 23rd Army, Department of Communications, and Familiar Stopping Grounds. 
It wasn't until the Consul General was touring in Guangdong it was where he toured. He appeared in factories, schools, and markets in Guangdong and many Chinese neighborhoods. When asked, he laughed off his concerns, saying he had merely been visiting old friends. The Consul General, it seemed. I had many old friends, realistically far too many for a man who hadn't been home in decades. The answer, of course, uh, lay in location. Many of the places he had toured saw unrest during the riots, not all, but uh, certainly enough to arouse some suspicion. On a map, his visits appeared less like a man journeying his old home and more like an intelligence officer building his network. Interesting. Dossier's him. Is there anything of his uh, uh, pre note in his previous postings? I can't speak anymore, apparently. Please. Nice. If we do this, it's getting better for us. Not too much better there, but whatever. From foreign shores. It was easy to trace the going on of a diplomat. Their expertise, preferences, and political leanings were discernible through long paper trails and foreign postings. It made Zhang Ziguang noteworthy, a man who chose to focus on Asia, specializing in public uh, <clears throat> uh, diplomacy and political affairs. It was not entirely surprising given the lack of diplomatic freedom afforded to Nanjing. Uh, curiously, the Consul General. Uh, his most exotic posting was not the streets of Germany or the avenues of Washington, but uh, uh, Russia amid the chaos of the West Russian War. It was a tradition among the diplomatic corps to give Russian diplomats foreign postings to help them grow acclimated, of course. Song, it seemed, had drawn uh, the short stick among the competition for foreign postings. Interesting. So we got two of them, but I don't think that's enough. Tyagas bears the tundras. There's at least one instance where the Council General discusses his early career. The celebrations of some minor security agreement struck between the RRGOC and the Guangdong administration. Russia had come up during the discussions amid some talk over the latest news emerging from Siberia in the Far East. Uh, Song had spoken about the conversation a man possessed, talking of a cold and harsh land populated by rugged people. In his words, the most intense learning uh, experience he could have asked for, even as his colleagues went on to Germania, Tokyo, or even Washington. He had said that it felt more familiar. Strange, the old Soviet Union had been involved with the KMT for years, yet the presence had faded by the time Song was of age, and the place came Americans, and to a lesser extent the British, with their money and arms. Perhaps Song had been referring to something more intangible. The Russians, after all, were familiar with lost wars. Food for thought. The case. Their revelations were troubling to say the least. There lacked a smoking gun, hard evidence of wrongdoing or diplomatic misconduct, but the picture painted did not speak well with Song's motivations, especially with the benefit of hindsight. The ongoing police investigation would look into any criminal conduct. They see that the Consul General had acted on his motives, yet until then there was ample enough reason to look further into a man's background and see what revealed itself. There would be need to cut contacts in the under underworld. The city gangs and double dealings that festered beneath the three pearls glistening lights that may be able to shed light on his dealings. Uh, police investigators to further dig into the song's checkered history and assistance from foreign service to look into the conduct of Russia. A web unravels. Unlimited detention. Concerning cycles, it began to develop within the crisis. A radical protest or a leader of a group gets in prison and brought before the court only to be released into the streets due to overcrowding and what do they do? Return to protesting on the streets. This has gone on. Uh, unaddressed really since the start of the protest. It's about time we do something about it. The law is no longer enough, but the people will cease illegal activity. No matter, it matters not what actions must, we must take to do this. Those detained will be detained indefinitely, at least until the entire situation is dissolved. The situation is too desperate for us not to, to do this, and we're going to have to put aside the dubiousness of this measure's legality. Firebreak. I'm more of aware than of Tokyo's concerns. Marita pinched the bridge of his nose. He's spoken to the uh, telephone receiver. Tokyo gets to read it about it. We have to live through it. Lee, Matsushita, Stanley Ho, and the Commissioner Amori all shot worried glances at each other as Morita hung up by the weary side. Despite being 15 stories up, with a fiery sunset lighting the room in brilliant amber, they could still hear the blaring of sirens outside the government complex. Another night of chaos, of vehicles overturned, storefronts set ablaze, and frantic street melees. Was coming, casting an inv invisible shadow over the sunlit room, seemingly stretching forth from Morita's sunken form. It is Consul General Takashimi didn't ask about the outlying cities he Lee breathed. Loosening his tie, the police authority barely extends past the walls of their stations these days. They never cared about what life is like outside the three pearls. They only cared about what the provinces gave to the bottom line, Stanley said darkly. I suppose that's working in our favor now. Even so, that bottom line. It's feeling the pinch, much as he said. Throwing his head back to stare at the ceiling, stop or work stoppages, depleting inventories, destroyed equipment. There's already talk amongst the resident Japanese about evacuating the provincial cities. Now this accelerates further, we'll go over uh, our heads to Tokyo, Commissioner Morisa, wringing his hands anxiously. Another sign is the Senate, as each man considered the obvious conclusion. If they do everything in their power to stabilize the situation, then Guangdong would be burned to ashes. Ah, oh, Sir Nam remains Dutch. Oh, look at that. Suspect. Oh, a search of the military archives in Nanjing found nothing. No record of Zhang Jiguang existed in the ranks of the RGOC evidence that he had fought on the losing side. The question now whether he was a communist or a national. Records from the Japanese observers in the romped Soviet Union before the West Russian War concluded or coincided with Zhang's tenure. A political officer in the Chinese diplomatic mission, one with a degree of familiarity with the communists and nerve of the observers, but had left a favorable impression on the Russians. 
Police reports from Song's suspected contacts meanwhile broke down in the two groups. Older men of Song's age and younger folks refused all of the basic information when interrogated. An inspection of their homes had revealed a cornucopia of social literature, Mal, Marx, Engels. A single armband was recovered from the home of an older suspect, blood red with an N4A, proudly emblazoned on its side. Bingo! And advice against movement. The time for half measures are over. We must commit to protecting the innocent in our own interests. Regrettably, screening public transport requires significant resources, and coupled with us having to deal with the protests themselves, we're easily overwhelmed and permits have long since stopped being useful as a means to control public movement activity. For the sake of the safety of all, we must declare a curfew. General restrictions of movements will be declared after sundown and keep the law abiding citizens of Guangdong safe from dangers outside. This can also help us pinpoint those who do not abide by the law, for they will be the only ones outside of, at late hours. They'll be swept off the streets while the innocent will be safe indoors. A dossier. The dossier pulled together by the GPF, the Manila folder sitting idly on the desk of the chief executive's office was explosive. To put it mildly, the Chinese consul general Zhang Jiguang, suspected communist and ex-member of the CCP's fourth, new fourth army, possibly an involvement in the communist anti-sphere, um, oh, what's the anti-sphere, uh, uh, anti-sphere activities through his uh, diplomatic career. Suspicious activity in Russia, a possible intelligent asset, used his time abroad to assassinate Japan's enemies, observe the Nanjing government, and subvert Guangdong through reports of protest uh, movement. And after Song recalled the Nanjing and placed under investigation. The war may have been over 20 years ago, but the RGOC remains an unfriendly place of communists, former otherwise, a smoking gun. Substantial evidence. Hey, we got advancements in computational power technology. Yay! I've got logistics too. We've got a lot of naval XP. We're not even having a navy. Passing, producing through doubts. After uh, the last meal of the day, when that sunlight has long since been replaced by the twinkling fires in Koshu streets, Chief Executive Marita Keo uh, thumbed the assembled evidence against a Chinese consulate general. The pages were dog eared, the contents were familiar to the Chief Executive, but he could not help but review them over and over again, given the scale of the decision at hand. Sadly, town would not be a luxury that Morita Kao would enjoy forever. It was already half a miracle that the Chinese hadn't caught on to the police investigation already. More time spent following up on leads concerning the activities of the Chinese government, and those of its two representatives in Guangdong, the greater the risk it would all be exposed, creating a diplomatic nightmare. And yet, in going the other direction, accusing General Consul General Song, Zhi Guang, and Attaché Wang Jingju of actively subverting Guangdong was absolutely guaranteed to cause a diplomatic incident if there wasn't enough proof to get Japan to take Guangdong's side. Would there ever be enough evidence to ensure that at and so, why waste more resources on a fool's error? Murdekyo sat and flicked through the pages again. I don't have enough. A uh, force suspicion took in Nanjing. Our case has to be strong enough to take it serious. Be taken seriously. Act with caution. There's no point in banning this. We have some darning evidence. Press claims. We could try that, maybe. Or against us. Unlimited detention. Only 10, that's not bad. On hold. Chief Executive Marita's Kyo's days were so occupied with crisis meetings and security briefings that it was easy to lose track of time. The ceaseless violence and dislocation of the riots seemed to warp time into an endless loop, extinguishing fires only to see them flare up again with each dawn. When not preoccupied with the latest emergency of the day, Marita Kyo's thoughts turned to the courier sent to Nanjing in Tokyo, and trust with copies of Guangdong's findings in Zhang Jiguang and Wang Jingju. They had been given instructions to show its contents to nobody but an individual Morita Kyo had named and the highest levels of government. No matter how long it took to get a meeting as a result, even then, it was taking longer than Morita had hoped, as the days blend into nights and then ended the days again, were pressing matters to priority. Protests worked to lay destruction, there was no shortage of bad news to be had, to the point that everything else faded into the background. Until Morita Kiao's secretary appeared in the chief executive's office, saying that Nanjing was calling and needed to speak immediately. Finally. Oh god. And if this doesn't go well, of course we're going to reload the save, but whatever. That's pretty normal for us, at this point. Red herring. Oh. The newspaper kids were making a killing these days, a businessman thought he was going to pick up his morning paper. Every day they had something new and important to scream about on the street corners, today was no different. Giant diplomats were called in Nanjing, the child bellowed right next to him as he picked up his paper, dropping a few coins into the child's box. Japanese request immediate recall. The businessman went through the ear-splitting noise and hurried away, burying his head in the paper. Consul General Zhang Jiguang and his attaché man named Wang had both been recalled in Nanjing for consultations with their home government. The Japanese had made this request based on unspecified allegations against the two, which the paper excitedly speculated that had something to do with the ongoing riots. Speaking of riots, the businessman flipped to the next page of the paper to see that five more people had died overnight, and an old block in one of the Chinese districts had burned, burned to the ground. More strikes, more citizens, more money fleeing the country. Well, the Chinese really had been supporting him, the rioters certainly didn't seem to be doing fine on their own, but to look elsewhere. So we exposed them, but they weren't any of the rioters, so we can't further investigate them, which is a Cruddy part, but we gotta go back and investigate that uh, Wang guy. From ill intents to malicious action, 
At first glance, the motive for any Chinese interference in Guangdong is self-evident. The Republic of China has never fully accepted Guangdong's existence. While Guangdong ruled itself by means of Tokyo's fiat, the Chinese government has gone out of its way to belittle and snub Guangdong in every single official matter that ways. Uh, an official way that matters. Bureaucratic delays, diplomatic snubs, and casual disdain have characterized nearly every interaction between Koshu and Nanjing. But a background history of resentment. Is enough to say that the Chinese are intervening now of all times. The Chinese have, with some encouragement from the Japanese, excuse me, from the Japanese and local Kenpai Tai, been grudgingly uh, economic intelligence partners with Guangdong for over a decade. We can assume that the Chinese have always been spying on us, but to cross line direct action under the nose of the Japanese, there had to be some catalyst, some stage directions transforming their ill intent into active disruptions. Even if they're scared behind coded language and misleading actions. Of course, getting our hands on these meaning messages and fully understanding these activities activities would mean bridging the diplomatic privilege enjoyed by the Chinese Consul General. The police proposed two courses of actions to intercept the Consul General's direct transmissions with Nanjing or their missive sent within Guangdong. What was the Consul General doing in the Guangdong itself? What are they doing? Through this trail. The suspect Wang Jingwu, a Han Chinese male, approximately in his uh, 50s, operates as a political attache from the Republic of China within the city of Guangdong. Heavy police surveillance over the course of several weeks I revealed a string of repeated movements conducted on a daily basis by the suspect. Though originally raising suspicion, these movements have been determined to be simply profession related visits to various minor officials, civil servants, and foreign representatives from within the co prosperity sphere. The suspect does not seem to engage in any kind of dubious activity, or go on any unusual breaks from his cyclical visits. Occasionally, he purchases a variety of newspapers from a roadside kiosk and spends up to 35 minutes or 30 minutes sifting through them before leaving. This behavior has been deemed to not be conspicuous and it results purely from leisure. As such, monitoring the suspect's whereabouts has ceased indefinitely as the time and resources could be spent elsewhere. Addendum. After weeks of silence, Guangdong police has declared suspect Wang Jingju free of any guilt of sedition in underground illicit factories. Reinvolpen. Uh, the investigation ramp up force, he has to be guilty. Advanced jet transports, yes. Oh. First step outside there were riots, bomb throwings the down of cocktails, slogans shouted, back and forth beings and all the rest, sheer madness, but it's still at least marginally restrained compared to what it could have been. Well the broader situation did not really matter to Imachi Hiroshi. She he had more urgent concerns. As many of the Chinese factory workers who joined up with the Committee of Chinese Labor, work had stopped utterly. Much only one idea to rectify the situation. They're arranging a meeting with some sort of the local of the local leaders of the CCL. His hope was, if not expecting things to get working again, at least to tap the ride down. Expecting a rebuff, he was surprised to hear back from him with an offer to meet. The meeting occurred in an impromptu conference room set up within an antenna factory. The antenna Ed Honcho attempted to accede certain workplace concessions in exchange for the resumption of work. In response, he only got a stone wall. The CCL man, although appreciative that Yamal was understanding his cordial in his approach, refused to do such a thing. And they were not nearly as hostile as they might have been if they were hell bent on not taking or talking at all. Unable to settle on a final deal, Yamal walked out. Yet there was still hope he had, after all, laid suitable grounds for further negotiations. From there, it could only go up. And a bit and tail. Things started to get, go wrong when Wayne got into the car that morning. The police still, following at a safe distance behind him, noticed that he was deviating from his usual route. The day was scheduled to attend a function at the local chamber of commerce instead, though he veered off into one of the Chinese districts. The cold feeling in the police car grew with each passing minute. If worst came to worse out there, they could just be in serious trouble. This, this was not a distant area, yet they had no illusions over who the crowds would back between the police officers and a senior Chinese official. Wang pulled over in front of a set of hawkers' stalls and got out of the car, staring directly at the police as they pulled in behind him. After a bit of chat among themselves, one of the officers got out to meet him. Found anything of interest, Wang snapped. Did you see my speech in the ballroom on Tuesday? It was a wonderful thing. Strange, though, that you or fellows would come after me. I know you're very stretched out at the moment, dealing with the riots. The officer scratched the back of his neck, fixed his eyes on the ground, and said nothing. The chief executive will be informed of this, Wang said, as will my superiors in Nanjing, so now go find something useful to do. Perhaps we could have been a little more careful. Caught it with their pants down. Well, that's not very good now, is that? Spotlight. What a disaster. So, uh, the press was having a field day with this one. The chief executive could clearly see Nanjing devils in his mind's eye, rubbing their hands with glee. Every local paper seemed to have a headline article on China's accusations of espionage against Guangdong. One particular publication accompanied this was a huge portrait of Consul General Song, glaring reproachfully in the camera. Mayor Takeo was summoned to Consul General Takashima's office in the mid-afternoon, which in itself was a bad sign. Takashima usually preserved uh, formalities by coming to him, unsurprisingly, this suggested he was pissed. And he was indeed pissed. 
Though it's just that Japan's public rebuke would no go further than expressing disappointment in Guangdong's disunifying actions, his private words to the chief executive went a lot further than that. At one point, he drew attention to General Nagano's absence from the meeting, a veiled threat that made Nagato Morita Akio's blood run cold. By the time his final letter of Takashima's office, the chief executive was feeling thoroughly humbled and more than a little frustrated with his investigation team. What a disaster! And Sardine Tin. Chen Zi Lok. A factory work affiliate with the GFT had gotten sent back to jail for the third time. One of the first things he noticed as the journal wore off and agreed to his surroundings was the fact that his cell was fuller than it had been the first two times. Another strange thing was the fact that the guards had once stopped speaking to the prisoners. Completely. The second time Chan had been in prison, they spoke about half as often as the first time. Except to shout at the prisoners to shut up in increasingly fluent Cantonese. When the prisoners did not quiet down, the loudspeakers would screech and then that would do the job very quickly. Next to him, Chan. Uh, ooh. Uh, pfft. Notice if you knew cellmate, a young student that he recognized as a CCL agitator. He tried to calm him down for fear of loudspeakers making another noise. See here, man, they'll just let us out soon. They can't very well hold all of us without pressing charges, and as I've done the first two times I've been here, a student. Scoff. BS. I've been here for two weeks. Two weeks, do you hear me? And I've never left the darn cell. That worried Chan, so it did. If this stripling wasn't just shouting about paranoid nonsense, they'd be waiting a long time, and meanwhile the cell is getting more and more crowded as we deploy armor. Deaths and injuries have increased exponentially on the anarchic streets of Guangdong, and the police force is slowly but surely getting pushed back by the chaos. It's clear uh, that the regular means of containing the violence on the streets are no longer sufficient in deterring the protesters or protecting the innocent, and that more resources and equipment must be allocated into this effort to pacify the streets. Fortunately enough, we are the possession of equipment that cannot be damaged by the roughly made tool and used by the protesters. Armored cars and vehicles will be deployed to protect our men from the savage protesters. Some may cause unnecessary intimidation and use of brute force, but the alternative is much, much worse. A tense meeting. In the Guangdong Police Force's offices, a report was being relayed by a nervous police sergeant. A staff form were numbered by the men, lower and higher ranking officers of the GPF. They watched in silence as he delivered his report. Ranging from the organization of disruptive protests and street marches to individual acts of terrorism and sabotage, the crimes of the CCL are well documented and widely accepted. Prosecuting members of the CCL should be easy enough, and so far we've managed to come down hard on a few minor lackeys of the group, he said. The police sergeant stopped for a moment where the response is the next sense could produce. The main issue in suppressing the CCL lies in prosecuting anyone of note. The occasional young worker dragged by a protest is not enough to curtail the activities of the leadership, which directs the CCL anonymously, and often with no clear links to the rank and file. The senior commissioner nodded slowly, staring intently at the board being used to document the movement of the CCL, normally a very composed and astute man. The seriousness of the recent protests had gotten to him. The superintendent general watched over him, having been pressured by the Guangdong government to seek clear and quick resolution of the recent issues. After a while, the senior commissioner joke spoke, We need a way to identify the leadership, and that's going to require some serious investigation. We can't rely on normal police suppression. The senior commissioner sighed, began rolling a cigarette. It seems to me what we have are one or two options. We can try to either pull some information from the street protest directly, or investigate into organizations associated with the CCL. Given how things are going in the men we have available, I think it's best thing we do for us would be to head down to the street and protest and pick some brains, investigate some of the organizations that might be covered in the CCL's works. But we're going to there. We were successful in d d pacifying the first group, the GFT, but the CCL has always been a much tougher nut to crack. So, if you enjoyed the first episode of us trying to get rid of these two groups, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow, so hopefully we can get rid of this crisis. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.